Hello, my name's Clint Locklear, and for everybody that's on my YouTube channel, you know who I am, but because of the title and subject matter of this, there'll be a lot of people out there that's just uh, seen me for the first time, so uh, I'm Clint, and I'm going to get into uh, of who I am here in a second a little bit, but guys, the reason I'm doing this, this little series, you know, is survival, trapping, and snaring just mental masturbation. It's because mostly the answer to that is yes. And I've got a whole library of survival books. I've been a prepper for decades. You know, I'm into all the cool tactical stuff and food storage. And I've been a professional trapper now for about two decades. So I've been professionally trapping on and on. And when I see, and other trappers, not just me, but other trappers that actually trap and catch animals on a consistent basis, see what the survival industry is selling or, or uh, putting out there to be able to catch animals, it's, it's really sad. I mean, it's really sad. Even the guys that are well known in the industry, you know, some of y'all do some amazing things. And I don't want anybody to think that I'm trying to do this video because I want to be arrogant or know-it-all or anything like that. That is not the purpose whatsoever. Some of the stuff in the survival industry as far as building fires and shelters and, you know, the tactical stuff and resistance and all the woodcraft and all that, I mean, it is amazing what is being taught in that and it's a skill that we, we need but when it comes to the trapping it, it's so bad it, it is it is just terrible for one it's so unfunctional and it's not going to work and people are putting their faith into it and it's and it's going to get people if they ever really have to use it it's going to get them really really hungry or dead is what it's going to do so I'm going to do a series where I'm going to try to break down a little bit of why I believe that mostly survival trapping and snaring is just mental masturbation because it's not productive and it's not a productive food system or a food flowage system or anything like that. It's just playing a little game is basically what it is. And, and I know a lot of you that watch this type footage are not watching this footage because it's a fantasy game to you. You want to be prepared for whatever it is that you're thinking may come your way. And if you're getting crappy information, you're going to have crappy results. And that, that's just the bottom line. Now, as far as me, um, I'm, like I said, I've been a professional trapper for a couple of decades. I'm going to start flashing uh, pictures because there's no reason to look at my ugly face through this whole thing. But I'm going to flash some pictures off and on, all throughout uh, this little spill I'm giving. And you can see from what you see on the screen that I'm not looking at trapping from a theoretical point of view or a scholarly point of view, or, or a fantasy point of view, it's from pure world, world uh, real world, getting it done day after day, year after year, catching animals consistently. So when you see that, you'll know that's the reason I'm putting that up there. And which brings up a good point, guys. Have you ever noticed that all the survival trapping gurus, they always have these cute little sayings of why they never actually set a trap for an animal, or they won't show one. For one, they're not catching anything. And two, they don't even trap. So there's no way that they're going to have footage uh, to, to show anybody. And it's not because people on YouTube don't like it. Go look at just regular trapping videos. we got animals hanging out of trees sometimes. There's so many of them being caught. But not in the survival world and not by the instructors and not by the books. They show you how to, to be able to catch your hand in a trap and how the physics work of it, stuff like that. But you don't actually see it. That's why I'm showing this pictures because you may not realize that there are people that can actually do this. And I'm not the best trapper. There are lots of trappers that are much better than me in this country. I just happen to be one this topic because I've been a prepper for so long. It, it's just been on my mind, so I'm gonna do it. Now what got this started, I'm really good friends with Meat Trapper. Uh, you can go check out his YouTube channel. And, and he does a podcast on my trapping radio. We do trapping uh, radio podcast uh, every Friday. He does one normally on Monday. He's more of the survival side, I'm more of the, the fur trapping side. And uh, we've been friends, and, and he did a, a show, and he said, go check this video out. And I think I'm getting it right, and if, if I'm not, excuse me, but you'll still be able to find it. It's called The Woody Beardsman. And it's a guy that uh, has a, one where he talks about really survival shows or starvation shows, and he goes into calories and numbers. And it's a very fascinating thing to watch that I promise a lot of survivalists would get very uncomfortable if they spent the time to watch that. And you know, then he goes on and they do their own little survival test 
It's like for five days, and the goal, which I think is genius, was to not lose weight in a survival situation because that's not what survival is. If you, if, especially if you watch these shows, you're just watching people starve to death. You might as well be watching people starve to death in a concentration camp somewhere because that's about all good that their survival skills are getting them. So just keep that in mind when we're going through this. Now the reason that I want to do it is I want to bring a little reality into this subject. And what the reality I'm talking about is actually catching animals actually productively consistently catching animals and that's not going to be done with sticks and strings i'm sorry it doesn't happen if you go back and look in history a lot of the indians that were still doing this when we came over a family was running from what people were saying at the time 300 traps a day just to keep up in in in, in a very rugged situation that was their everyday life 300 traps so Unless you're going to be able to pull that off or you think you have some type of great wisdom that someone that's lived in the woods their whole life that's doing this, I don't really know what you think you're going to do with, you know, a couple of rolls of floor wire from Walmart or some military trip wire and some 550 cord, you know, because those aren't very functional anyway in catching, which we're going to get into very in depth as we go along in this little series. So I want to bring some reality into it. I want to give you the chance once you get a little reality into this, to be able to make a, the best choice for you. Whether you believe me or not, and I suggest that you don't, just do your own thinking and do your own digging and you'll kind of figure out that I'm pretty spot on about what I'm getting ready to say. But come up with your own best solution. See, solutions is, is what you want the outcome to be. You know, do you want to go in the woods and get a couple of squirrels and starve to death maybe just a little bit slower? Is that what your solution is? If it is, you know, stick with the primitive stuff that's being taught because that's, that's basically what's going to happen. But if your you're end solution wants to be that you're not going to starve to death, then you need to look at a, maybe a different way of going about it because um, I'm in permaculture. We're not going to get into that, but that's a design science, the way that you look at things and you design stuff. You'll hear me say that a lot. Now, when you know what your solution is, you design on the front side of that to meet whatever the, the end goal of that solution needs to be. Whether it's, you know, getting clean water, starting a fire, whatever you, you build. It's like all of y'all have fire kits I'm sure you know from primitive to a lighter well see that's a design way to get you your fire but when it comes to the food it's just so sketchy on how that's going to happen but the problem is that I see in survivalists because they they know what the solution needs to be which is food which is calories fats uh, you know different vitamins and minerals different things like that they impose something in front of that solution they're not looking for the best solution they're imposing the quote survivalism of bushcraft, all that type of stuff in front of the solution. And when you impose something on a solution, you no longer will end up with the correct solution because you've already skewed the data. So if, if you're wanting to be able to go out so bad with, a, with some 550 cord and a knife and this, that, and the other, and go out and be able to live in the woods and be like a mountain man, because you're imposing that to begin with, you're already setting yourself up for failure because you've skewed, skewed the data. And, and, and at the end of all this, I'm hoping that I can get some of you that are doing this more seriously. Now, I want you to listen to what I'm saying here and don't try to add anything or, or try to find different meaning of what I'm saying. If you're into the survival trapping because it's a cool thing to do and you enjoy it, Rock on, man. That, that, that's, it is. I mean, I know how to do dead fours and uh, uh, the, the dead falls and, and all the, the primitive snares that I've deconstructed as far back as I can from what a real snare is. I have went through all that. It's a cool thing. It's a great thing to teach your kids how uh, fulcrums work and leverage and all that you have to do with primitive traps. It's a fun hobby to have. And if it's just a hobby to learn that type of stuff and that's really all you're doing with it, hey, knock yourself out. But what I'm talking about is if you're actually thinking that you want to be in control of your own food systems, you've got to start looking at things in, in a term that's called food flowage system. And I hate to tell you, but primitive trapping is not it. 
And we're going to get into what that is in a lot. And, and I want you to start thinking of when you're thinking going out in the woods and you're, you're, you're training, preparing, whatever the words you want to use to be able to get you on food one day, that you start thinking in a, a term called meat forging. Because most of you know what forging is, and then we're going to put meat in front of it. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a system that if someone kind of wraps their head around, they're going to go forge for meat. It's very different than this primitive trapping, which you'll get, which you'll understand a lot more when we get done with this series. So that, that's the reason. Now, the, the biggest thing I want you to understand, I'm ex-military. used to jump out of airplanes, wear uh, green face paint, lived out of a rucksack, uh, was a 60-gunner, all that stuff. So I know what exactly what it is to be in some harsh terrain where, where you've got some people that aren't very happy with you and, and all that type of stuff. But let's break it down even a little further than that. If you were going to have a conflict with me, and since I always carry a Kimber 45, and you come up with a knife, you're probably going to lose. That's the old saying that you don't ever bring a knife to a gunfight. Primitive trapping and snaring is not even bringing a knife to a gunfight. It's a rubber knife. I mean, the, the best you've got chance to do is either make a comic thing out of it for me so I start laughing and leave you alone, or you try to slap me in the face like, uh, you know, the Three Stooges or something. But in a real fight, you're going to lose that because you didn't bring what you needed to bring. Now, one thing in the military that was uh, very clear to any of us that were in combat arms, you never, ever, under any circumstances, fight fair. Fighting fair is for losers. Now, we're not talking sports or anything like that. If you get in a situation where you're, you're fighting fair, like going out in the woods with just a, a knife and some cordage and some stuff, you, you're already way behind the game. You don't want to fight fair when you get in that situation. You want to be above the curve, just like you don't want to go set an ambush with six people on 10,000 people coming down the trail. That's kind of stupid. You want the 10,000 on six people that's coming down the trail. So if, you're, if, you, if you think about this, where if it was a real survival situation, and you're bringing a rubber knife to the gunfight, how bad and negative that's going to be. And the reason I'm saying you're bringing a rubber knife it's because it's not even a real knife. And the traps and the, and the techniques, like the traps, are designed to fire some way or another. But most of them won't catch any animals. And if they do, it'll be once in a blue moon and you'll done starve to death by then. That's why you don't see people that do a lot of survival teaching and trapping show animals very often because they can't catch them either, guys. That's how bad the stuff is. I mean, I want you to think about something. I've got friends that are in the ADC, animal damage control business, and they catch a ton of squirrels. Squirrels is a big deal to survivalists for some reason. So we're going to talk a little bit about squirrels. Squirrels can chew through vinyl siding and three-quarter inch plywood to get in your roof. And you're going to put a loose, uh, a loose rope around him and think he's not going to chew out of that. And if you're already thinking, well, that's why we got to get him off the ground. Well, that always doesn't work, and they can still chew unless it's a perfect catch, and you can get them out of the game very, very quickly. They have teeth. Same thing with beavers and raccoons and possums and different things like that. Because you can, the, the, the fallacy in the survival trapping is, if it can catch your hand or maybe conceivably catch something, then it's a skill. It, that's not a skill. It has to consistently catch and hold and retain that animal till you get there, or kill him, whichever way you want to go with it. So that's why you need to have something that's real. The way that a lot of the primitive snares work, animals are not even taken into consideration because for uh, primitive traps to work most of the time, you need an uh, animal that was born yesterday who's drunk, deaf, and retarded before he gets caught in them. And that's just a fact. And the reason I know that, because we do trap so much and, 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 and go out and find ways to productively catch stuff. When you see something from a trapper's perspective, and you, it's so obviously wrong, like when you, when you hold up your snares with forked sticks, how is it going to close? You know, there's things that's never taken into consideration. You, you push sticks in the ground, and you're going to put a a big whipping tree over there so you can yank your squirrel off the ground or you know you got these the fork sticks in there that's going to hold the toggle 
and then you put it in dry ground. It, is it never going to rain in a, a survival situation where the ground softens up because your trap's not going to work at that point? If you're using a little bitty wood stakes like I see people all the time doing on YouTube, an animal's just going to pull it up and walk off with it. And now you've wasted your time and you still don't have any food. But the biggest thing is they're not taken into account at the animal or the location of where they go. People always just say you put them on a trail. What does that mean? Does that mean I-85? Does that mean a trail on a river? Does that mean it's a trail for a squirrel? Or is it actually a raccoon trail? Because those two traps won't hold each other. I mean, as far as you need a totally different from one to the other. Which trail are you talking about? It's so clear from the YouTube video. That's never a consideration. They'll figure it out when they have to. And I call BS on that, guys, because it doesn't work that way. But I'm going to tell you a little truth about trapping. And if you know a trapper that's been doing it for five or ten years, um, fur trapping, I want you to go honestly ask him a question. You're probably going to get something very similar to what I'm going to tell you. I was the same exact way. This was after going to survival school in Alaska, which we called uh, cool school, where the, the pilots came down, they went through all this trapping and stuff like that, which they never ever caught anything once I asked the instructors. That's why they brought in frozen rabbits for us to skin. But after even that, I started trapping into Alaska. I was trapping Martin and Fisher. Uh, I did fair. I mean, I was, it, was, it was not very productive, but the, the money was there because they were high dollar animals. I come back here, I've been reading all the books on coyotes and bobcats and raccoons and I've seen all the videos and I've been to trapping conventions and I've done all that. I've got all this cool gear sitting there and I go out and I try to trap and I get my butt kicked. Every trapper starts that same exact way. They have all the enthusiasm, they have all of the book knowledge, but they don't have any of the experience. So when they get out there, they get their butt kicked. Now, what do you think is going to happen to someone that really has never caught animals because it's just a mental exercise that they do, and now they're going to be hungry, maybe worried about their wife or kid, or injured, or they got to worry about security, and when we're getting our butt kicked as trappers with the best equipment in the world, we've got a full belly, don't have to worry about security, full tank of gas, and if we get really hungry, there's a McDonald's on every intersection. But somehow a survivalist just think this magically going to show up and this knowledge is going to come down from some god somewhere that's going to be like the old Indian god that's going to put the knowledge into you to be an Indian all of a sudden you're going to know how to do that. It's not going to work that way. Especially, especially with crappy equipment, which is sticks and strings are. And like I said, if it's just a hobby, rock on, it's a cool thing to learn. If you're doing it for food, don't do it. And don't come looking for food with a rubber knife because that is exactly what you're doing and if you don't believe me we're gonna we're gonna go over a couple of things here real quick we're gonna put survival food procurement in realistic terms the average man in a stressful high energy type situation which would be in being out in the in a rough part of the terrain where you've got to really watch your back get your own food and stuff like that it's about 3500 calories a day 3,500 calories a day. So you, someone's going to go out with a couple of rolls of little wire and some 550 cord and a knife and a hatchet, and they need to procure 3,500 calories per day. Because if you don't, your body starts eating itself. It starts getting sick. You start making worse decisions, which is going to start making you even get any sicker, and you're going to starve yourself even faster, which is what basically when you see people do survival stuff, they starve. This is the one that can hold out the longest is pretty much what it is. So food procurement, 3,500 calories. What does that mean? It means you've got to catch 25 squirrels a day. Have you ever thought what it takes to catch 25 squirrels a day? Now, I've got state-of-the-art equipment to catch squirrels. I don't know. I, I, can, I can probably honestly say I couldn't go out in the woods and catch 25 squirrels a day with a full belly and a full tank of gas. As a professional trapper, I'm saying that. Now someone, and that's with good equipment, and I know a lot about squirrels and I know a lot about animals. That's 25 a day. Now what does that mean to someone that doesn't get 25 squirrels a day? That means you're going backwards. And if it's any type of long-term situation, you're gonna starve to death. 
So that see, that's not saying that a couple of squirrels isn't going to help. That's just saying it, that's not the solution you're looking for. You know that that's not the solution. So let's put this in a more personal type term. Say you're watching this and you're the man of the house and you have a wife and you have a 10 year old kid. Now you're responsible to be a man to feed your family, correct? That's what men do. It's, you know, that's what men do. Men find a solution to feed their family. So you're gonna be the, the squirrel master. That's the only thing you're really worried about with squirrels and rabbits. That means you're gonna have to catch 50 squirrels a day. Good luck at doing that. But the number that gets really crazy is to do that for a year, that's 18,250 squirrels. Ain't gonna happen. It is not gonna happen. So going the squirrel route obviously is not the best way to go about this. If food procurement is actually what you're doing for because you're gonna need the calories, you're gonna need the vitamins, minerals, and stuff like that. And then now someone's gonna go, <clears throat> Okay, well, I can forage for plants at the same time. You know, uh, I know a lot about wild plants. Being in permaculture, I grow all my herbs, I grow all of my starches, I grow all of my fruits, I grow all of my vegetables, I grow all of my nuts. I grow everything. I mean, I am my own grocery store. That is my food flowage system. It's not the grocery store and it's not sticks and strings. But herbs and plants and stuff are everywhere. That is true. I mean, you foragers always say that. There's food in your front yard. That's absolutely right. There is, if you know what it is. But what they don't tell you and where when you impose the foraging in front of food procurement from a real way, you're setting yourself up to either die of diarrhea or you're going to starve to death. Because those are the two realistic uh, endings that you're going to get from this. There's not another option there, guys. There's really not. So if this is serious, what you want to do, wake up a little bit. Because we're going to use dandelion greens. And you can look up all different kinds of plants that you get with leaves and stuff like that. There's normally about 40 calories per cup. So to get 3,500 calories of that, you've got to eat four cups shy of a bushel basket. And if you don't know what a bushel basket is, go get two five-gallon buckets. Fill one of them all the way up with grass and the other one just two inches shy on the other side because there's 9.309 gallons in a bushel. So basically go look at what two five gallon buckets of, of forged plant life looks like to get 3,500 calories. Now you could probably pick it, but are you going to be able to eat it? And if you do try to eat basically 10 gallons of stuff like that. Do you think you're gonna get through the first five gallon bucket before you start crapping yourself to death? Something to think about. See, the solution was not right. So that's the reality of what food procurement means. Now, your solution is gonna be different than mine, I'm pretty sure, and that's totally fine. That's, that's what design means. There's no silver bullet here guys there's no magic answer there's no special trap there's no anything but you need to know why that you need to learn how to catch food which is gonna gonna bring me to two topics that i'm sure some of you are going to get very upset with me on i'm not doing this to make you mad i'm doing this to make you think so please understand this is coming from the goodness of my heart with me doing this now first you've got fantasy Fantasy is a survival thing that if you get in a, a survival situation the way that most uh, primitive survivalists talk about or preppers talk about, you know, you're the lone survivor out of a jet airplane when everybody else dies. You're in a third world country somewhere and you've got, you know, a pocket knife and some toenail clippers and you're going to go out and rebuild civilization. That's the fantasy of that. Or you're going to be in a boat wreck and you're going to be on an island where there's no humans and no boats come by for several years. That's a fantasy of what would happen. You know, you're going out camping and there you have an accident and it turns into this great big survival situation. That could happen a little bit more probable than the first two. But as many times as I've been hunting and all the people I know that go hunting, I've yet to know anybody that's really been in a situation like that. They might get lost a little bit 
but it's never in a I'm going to die situation type thing, unless hypothermia or something's brought into the, the picture there. And that's not food anyway, that's just not having the right stuff with you. So to come to the right solution, what is the reason that you're, that you're going to be able to plan for and design for? Is it going to be for fantasy? If it is, and it's just a game, no, no big deal. Because you, because you're not really, I don't think, planning at that time to have to be able to live off what you actually catch. So, you know, when I say mental masturbation, that's just fantasy. That's what it is. It's the fantasy of being in some crazy situation that you probably have a better chance of winning the lottery twice than you do being in that situation once. So, I and mean, just think about the odds. It, it's not very good. Now, more realistic, the reason I think food is, is learning how to have food flowage systems and be a meat forger is so important, is we live in an unstable world. It seems very stable as everything clicks and everything seems to work out just right. But to be realistic, you know, when it comes to why I think I would ever need these skills beyond just uh, add on to what I already do now, you know, I'm looking at possibly war, that would screw up our food systems and, and the grocery stores really, really quick. You could have race wars. You could, uh, loss of uh, grids, maybe EMP, maybe hacking, maybe something like that. You shut down the uh, electricity in this country, it's going to go haywire for a long time. So there, there's something you're probably more probable is going to have. Uh, you could have massive riots if you're in an urban si situation. I mean, the interesting thing to me is we ain't never seen riots out here in the Appalachian Mountains. Just saying. Okay. It could be an economic crash. This is a very realistic thing. You can look at Venezuela right now today what an economic crash looks like. Not the, not the uh, you know, end of the world, zombie scenarios and all that type of stuff. I'm talking real stuff that could happen and the economy crashing wouldn't be that hard for that to happen. So and if the economy crashes, you're going to have to, if, especially if you got a family, you're going to have to figure out a way better beforehand than after to be able to deal with this. Now, the other, let's see, but mostly what it could just basically boil down to is you could lose your job or you can be in a small town like I am, and the industry goes away like it did, and a lot of people lost their jobs, and a lot of people ended up on food stamps, and they lost their cars. Um, I mean, it got really, really rough on a lot of people when big industry just pulled out. That's probably the most realistic thing you can do. Now see, if you learn food flowage systems or how to be a meat forger, you know, you're still gonna figure out how to, way to keep your house, how to you keep your, you and your kids warm or cool, all that other stuff, but the, the one of the main things that will grind on you more than you ever realize if you've never actually been through it before is hunger. Now, when I was in the Army and we were eating MREs, which are high calorie type things, uh, we had all the calories we wanted, and if you would have listened to us in any conversation pretty much after about two weeks, all we talked about was food. Everybody. It didn't matter if you were skinny, fat, didn't make any difference. You talked about food. Hunger will drive you crazy. Having a hungry family will drive you to do things that you morally probably wouldn't do otherwise. So don't put yourself in that situation. Man up ahead of time so you don't have to man up after. So if you lose a job and you can scramble around and, and do whatever you need to do and you can cover the food aspect through a, a, a food flowage system and you're, everybody's full and happy with that, you can actually then go to get stuff done. Now, if you're going to do it as a, a primitive survivalist, all day is going to be spent trying to catch your 50 squirrels. Now, when you talk to people that make a lot of these, and you listen to what they say on their own videos, 20 to 30 minutes apiece, that's two an hour, and a 12-hour day, so what, 24 traps, so you gotta now catch two squirrels in each one of your traps to even feed yourself for the next day when you're not losing ground. When, when somebody like me goes to set a squirrel snare, it's 20 seconds. When I go to set a deer snare, it's about 30 seconds. When I need to catch a bobcat, which are delicious by the way, but when I go to catch a bobcat, you're talking five or 10 minutes. I can set beaver, uh, I can catch beaver, 
in less than a minute by the way that I'm setting up and they're very functional and they actually work but the flowage system that's not just the meat it's other stuff that you got to take into consideration uh, so, you know the forging is important if, if you started looking at ways to grow food at your own place right now just look at how that would take a lot of stuff off of you like I said we're talking more about realistic things that can happen than the fantasy part that happens and if you always want to run down that fantasy part of just you know going out with some sticks and strings there's nothing I can do to help you but you're 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 training for fantasy is what you're doing and the way you train is the way it's going to be. And if you're if you're if you train for a fantasy, you're only preparing for fantasy. And that, guys, is mental masturbation. Now we're going to do some more series where we're going to get into why and how you can go and all of a sudden become where meat and fats, which most people leave out, can become part of a normal system that you can set up where. You can have some of the best quality meat because survivalists always seem to look at what they're catching as, you know, you'll just have to suck it up because you're starving to death. You know, that, that, that's crazy to me. The way I want you to look at when you go out into the woods, instead of seeing scarcity, guys, you need to see absolute abundance. And if you're prepared to pick that abundance or catch that abundance, which is there and would be there even in a major crisis, you will be so much better off than you'll ever be <coughs> trying to set a 150 pound rock up to catch one raccoon in a deadfall because you need that much weight to kill one. Why not just set a snare that you can have ahead of time and go out and catch them? Same thing with, uh, with, with uh, trying to, you know, it, it's cool and fun to play around with some, with some fishing stuff that's very primitive. Why? Why? That's, that's my main question. Why? I mean, I've got a fishing kit right now that I've never used. It's been there for about seven years. I make sure the reels are old. I replace the monofilament line every two years, and I've got to use it for fun fishing. So if I ever need to go fish, I can reach in there and get my gill nets. I can get my throats. I've got a way that, I've, that I can take a turtle trap with me on the same little rucksack. It's got all the hooks and sinkers and lures and all that in there I would need till I was an old man. Now, why would I need to go primitive trap if I needed to go catch fish? The solution is to catch fish. How you do it is better with a rod and reel, better yet, a... a hoop net or a gill net or some of the way like a commercial fisherman because that's what I want that's the main thing that you're gonna have to get if you're gonna be in this but food procurement is food production and when when trappers like myself go out and make a living trapping it's production it's volume and it's done very quickly you know the survival model is very inefficient after very small game that has very little calories but takes a lot of time. So that's all backwards when you're looking at production. So the way I want you to think about what you're looking at in your own food procurement, is it a productive production system or is it just set up for fantasy? See, that's just something every survivalist, prepper, man, woman, if you've got children or someone that's dependent on you, that's something you need to ask and you need to come up with the right solution for the, the answer that you give, and you need to give it honestly. So we're going to have some more in this series where we're going to talk about the difference between primitive and some different stuff like that so you can kind of start seeing why, how bad it is. And, and, I'm gonna, and I'm not going to be doing it to be picking on anybody, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, we're going to look at some videos on YouTube together, and I'm going to show you just how insane that it is that someone thinks that's going to actually work. So... Hope you're not mad, but I hope you're thinking.